Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the CHS Open House. Um, this is the first of our afternoon session of panels. Uh, very pleased to invite you to join the Asian Studies panel. Uh, we have with us uh, Professor Ong Changwei, who is going to be moderating our session. And we are joined by panelists, uh, Prof. Vatana, Prof. Rajesh Rai, Dr. Suryani, as well as Dr. Clay. Thank you so much. And over to you, Prof. Ong. Uh, thanks, Nisha. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming uh, to our panel uh, this afternoon. Right? But the purpose of this panel is actually to I mean, convince you that uh, even if you do not intend right, to major in uh, one of the five uh, Asian studies uh, subject, right, it is in still important right, that you know Asia right, on an intellectual and academic uh, level. Right? So before we begin, right, let me introduce the, the panelists for the day. So my name is uh, Ong Chang Wei and I represent uh, the Chinese department. And uh, Professor Vatana uh, uh, Fosena uh, represents uh, Southeast Asian studies. And Dr. Clay Eaton represents Japanese studies. Right? He's also the main lecturer for HSA 1000, uh, Integrated Asian Studies, which we will hear uh, a little about right in a moment. Uh, we will invite him to present and introduce the, mod uh, the module in the greater details uh, in a while. And uh, Dr. Surani, uh, Sratman here represents uh, Malay studies and Professor uh, Rajesh Rai represents uh, South Asian studies. And uh, today's session will be divided into two parts. Right? In the first part, sorry, Dr. Eaton will spend about 10 minutes discussing what HSA 1000 is about and what can you expect to learn from this module. Uh, some of you might wonder right, why NUS is actually forcing me to do a compulsory module on Asia when my interest is really in, for instance, physics, math, or psychology, right? So this is a perfect opportunity for you to find out why we, we should be your top choice, right? Because CHS, right, is the only program in Singapore, I believe, that makes the study of Asia an integral part right, of your education through this module. And I will now invite uh, Dr. Ethan, right, to explain the rationale, right? Over to you, Clay. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. So I've got a couple slides ready, but it's a pleasure to meet everyone. My name is Clay Eaton. I'm a lecturer in the Japanese Studies Department. And while I'm a historian, I specialize in World War II in Singapore. Uh, I'm one of the lecturers for HSA 1000, Asian Interconnections, which is the big integrated module in Asian studies. So let me go ahead and get my slides running. A little sneak preview of an image I'm showing. That um, Okay. So... We're gonna be talking today about Asian studies and CHS, starting with a little bit about the module, but then showing how it's connected to the rest of Asian studies and connected to your experience at the university as well. So here we are at a university in Singapore, and there's a particular value here of studying Asian studies, right? Studying Asian studies in Asia, right? Asia is, of course, a very important continent, very important to Singapore and its future, very important to the world and its future as well, right? And one of the things we're doing at the university is learning to go a little bit deeper in our knowledge of the world around us. One of the big questions that we ask in the module to get us into thinking about being in Asia and studying Asian studies is we ask the question, what do we take for granted? when we look at different topics in Asian studies. In your previous education, you might've spent a lot of time, say, memorizing the Krebs cycle or memorizing the start date and end date of World War I, things like that for tests. But now at the university, you have an opportunity, no matter what major you're in, to go deeper in your understanding of your preferred field. And so we're doing something here that is an exercise that helps us understand Asian studies but is useful as a skill, no matter what major you're in. Learning to recognize what we take for granted and digging deeper and looking at the complexities of the world around us. Just a very quick introduction to that. In our first lecture, we'll talk about the idea of Asia itself. Now, in this picture, you see an image of Asia that you might be very familiar with, right? The Asia that you learned about in primary school. These are its borders. This is its relationship with the other continents. Very good, you can identify which countries are in it, moving on. But now that you're at the university level, it's time to think more deeply about what Asia really is. Because one inconvenient thing about Europe and Asia and the division between them is it's not as solid as you might think. 
For instance, let's go to the city of Istanbul, one of the largest cities in the Middle East. But in fact, Istanbul is a city between two continents. This part is technically part of Europe. And this part is technically part of Asia. And it's not like on one side of this narrow strip of water, which actually has a tunnel under it that you can't see. It's not like people on one side use chopsticks and people on the other side use fork and spoon or anything like that. In the end, the boundary between Europe and Asia is in a lot of ways pretty artificial. For instance, if you went to the border of Europe and Asia in Russia and Kazakhstan, to go back to this slide, you'd find out that mo much of it is actually empty space. Not really clear which part is Asia and which part is Europe. Asia, like many of the other concepts we'll cover in the course, is in fact what we call a social construct. Geographers will point out there's no real physical definition that adequately separates Europe and Asia. It's really just one continent, Eurasia, Eurasia. But the idea of Europe and the idea of Asia are still very important. To put it bluntly, the idea of Europe in particular became a way for Europeans to separate themselves out from other people living in Eurasia, to, to say that they were separate and special in a way. But why do people today, given that, in Asia, continue to use the term when in physical geography, it doesn't really exist? Well, because it exists in people's minds. It shapes people's behavior. The idea of Asia, while a little bit disconnected from actual physical geography, is a powerful idea in human history. But because it exists in people's minds, the definition of Asia can change over time. And this is just one example of one of the concepts that you might think of as fundamental in your schooling to this point. But actually, if you look a little bit below the surface, you see it is much more complex than it appears on the surface. And so we take the semester as looking especially at some of the most important issues in Singapore and in Asia, the regions around Singapore, and talk about how complex these issues are, going past and beyond the simple explanations for how these things came to be. So just a quick sort of introduction. We're really working on connecting concepts from the module with the world around us. Our current coverage is race and ethnicity, migration and diaspora, social inequality, and religion, four topics that you might think are like basically clear cut settled, but in fact are extremely complex, which is why they are so important to understanding Asia today. And in a broader sense, we're learning to recognize complexity and to dig deeper, to go beyond the simple concepts that we might have been introduced to in our earlier schooling and take the opportunity in university to really understand their different facets. We're looking at connections between our personal lives in one of our assignments and our immediate surroundings in a neighborhood guide that you'll make as a group, between co connections between these things and the concepts we cover in class. Right? These aren't just abstract concepts that have nothing to do with the real world. They're incredibly important to understanding the real world. And so we focus on making those connections. We also focus on recognizing how interconnected different parts of Asia are. It's part of the name of the module. And in doing so, we learn to communicate our ideas, right? Through speech, in our tutorial discussions, and through writing. Now, there is a little bit of writing here, which might be intimidating to some who haven't really focused on writing for the past couple of years. But we have a large teaching team with representatives from all of the Asian Studies Department who are here to help you work on those skills, which are critical, regardless of your major. The ability to communicate your ideas, either through speech or writing, will help you no matter what you end up specializing in. And just to introduce everyone to a couple comments that have been made about our course, some feedback we've received from our students. Won't necessarily go through each and every one of these, but for instance, students said that it broadened their knowledge about Asia in general and how to think more critically about many different issues. Some of the students liked how the readings were quite relatable to their own lives, right? Many people talked about it broadening their horizons. Many liked the group work, especially the neighborhood guide that they made as a group because it gave people a chance to bond with people who weren't necessarily in their major. 
People liked being able to discover connections to their family heritage or to different neighborhoods in Singapore. And for those who were studying remotely, their own neighborhoods in their own part of Asia. And working on this ability to sort of communicate your ideas in tutorial and working on listening to other people's ideas as well showed many students that many of these topics which are very important and because of that, a little bit sensitive, we can have a constructive discussion about. They're not necessarily just taboo. So we work on those skills, expressing our ideas, listening to others, and thinking through some of the more complex issues that Asia faces today. So that's what we're focusing on in HSA 1000. But this also connects to the general approach to Asian studies that we have in CHS and at NUS. After HSA 1000, it's important that our teaching team for the module and all the departments in Asian studies are highly interdisciplinary. You don't have people who specialize on just one thing, right? So I'm a historian, but there are many people in these departments, some people who specialize in business, in politics, in popular culture, in linguistics. And what's really critical here is that we learn from each other not just as students, but as faculty too. We build off each other's expertise, right? Focusing on the same general area, so having a common context, we can learn from someone who say, I'm a historian, who specializes in contemporary politics or literature. From my experience, and I come from an area studies background as well, I am better as a historian as a result of these interactions with people who specialize on religion, economics, and other fields. So it's a highly disciplinary, interdisciplinary experience working on Asian studies in CHS. It is also highly interconnected. Every department that focuses on Asian studies contributes to our teaching team in HSA 1000. And in fact, HSA 1000 is the first module in the Asian studies minor. You are encouraged to look at the topics that we cover in unfortunately the brief time we have in one semester and further your interest in them. Continue to study them with the many excellent faculty members we have in the different departments and programs in Asian studies. And so while the departments and programs might focus on one region or one group, they are in fact quite interconnected as well. And in general in Asian studies, the big focus is on getting to know a place, not just skimming along the surface and focusing on one thing, but to really understand how a society works, how a region works together. And so in our different departments and programs, we focus on language study because it's important to be able to learn about a place. You've got to read things in that language, speak with people in that language. We have a heavy emphasis on field experience and exchange. One of the things that has been set back a little bit with the pandemic, but we are working very hard to get going. And also we focus on internships real world applications of what you're learning in the classroom. And I'll just note on the note of internships, not everything is about what comes after the university, but at the same time, employers do really appreciate the cultural competency that they see in our majors and our minors. So that's the general idea. HSA 1000 is an introduction to getting to know the world around you at a deeper level, and you'll have the opportunities to go even further in these studies in the various modules that are offered in the Asian studies departments and programs and the various opportunities for majors and minors in them as well. So what do we take for granted? Well, the first step in recognizing that is stopping and thinking seriously about the world around us, which is something we'll start doing right away in HSA 1000. Thanks. Uh, so is that all? Yeah, that's okay. all for that. Thanks, Lee. Uh, I'm not sure whether you're convinced, but I am. <laughs> okay, so, um, I mean, uh, yeah. So uh, having an in-depth understanding of Asia, right? And then the uh, cultivating the skills of uh, effective communications through critical readings and writing, right? Actually, uh, are some of the essential things that we do in this module, right? So I hope that uh, this will be actually be a very important right, module for, for your en entire education uh, with us in NUS, right? And uh, before we go to the uh, second half of the session, 
uh, I'm sure that uh, Dr. Ethan will be happy to answer some questions. And um, um, uh, because of time constraint, we can only take a few, right? So uh, please take this opportunity to answer, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to post your questions using the chat uh, functions. And the floor is now open. Any questions from anyone from the audience? Yeah, and you might be able to see a Q&A function down at the bottom as well. Uh, yeah, the, the Q&A function, I'm sorry. So the check function is uh, reserved for us. <laughs> Any specific questions about the module? Anyone? Oh. Yep, we do have one coming in. Okay, it, good question about the difference of uh, South Asian studies and history modules on South Asia. I think uh, Prof. Rai can also answer this question. Um, but just, just to start off, right? We, in HSA 1000, we cover history, we cover sociology, various schools of the humanities and social sciences, right? But in a way that puts these fields in conversation with each other. But maybe Prof. Rai can say more about the specifics of South Asian studies. Um, so uh, a lot of what uh, Clay touched on extends to South Asian studies as well, in the sense that we, uh, like other Asian studies departments here, are interdisciplinary in nature. So we certainly do have some history oriented courses, but you will find that in many of the modules offered at South Asian studies, there is an interdisciplinary character. So in addition to history, we'll look at politics or economics and so on and so forth. So many of our modules are constructed in that way, which is not to suggest that you can't do a history, uh, South Asian history module in the department of history, but there the focus will be more in a disciplinary fashion so it'll be tighter focused on the historical aspects and perhaps you will not get these other elements. Um, so this is how a module in South Asian studies differs uh, to some degree from a module that's offered at the history department. I should mention, however, that a number of these are recognized across board. So uh, a history department South Asian module would be recognized by my department as well. And I'm sure this extends to the other departments too. And we have actually two questions uh, regarding job prospects. Of course, one is actually uh, directed uh, at uh, Southeast Asian studies. So, Patana, do you want to answer that question? And then yeah, we can sure. answer the second thing. Yes, right? no, this is a very excellent question. So I think um, with a Southeast Asian studies degree, I think uh, you have the opportunity to go and uh, uh, in a wider, wider range of, uh, of careers. I guess with your, it could be in a, in a private sector and private companies. As a matter of fact, uh, we had uh, one of our recent uh, alumnus uh, graduate uh, just got a job in a risk advising advisor firm. And he believes that actually his boss uh, told him that uh, the reasons why they hired him because uh, he had languages, he could speak uh, Vietnamese and Indonesian. And also because uh, they believe that his uh, cross-cultural competencies would be really useful uh, uh, in their line of work. Um, also, you could uh, become a public servants, work in ministry, various ministries, Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Education as well. We had uh, several alumni that have been working in those ministries. Uh, another area, um, for example, uh, NGOs, um, we have uh, a few of our graduates uh, that are now uh, working overseas in NGOs, uh, for example, uh, recently, quite recently in Laos, uh, because uh, she took uh, one of our modules uh, that were focused on uh, uh, race and ethnicity, majorities and minorities. And we had quite a few classes on countries such as Laos, uh, Cambodia, Vietnam, and so on. Um, another possible career is uh, in journalism. Um, we have, uh, well, actually, she just graduated again a, a few years ago, and she works now for uh, the Straits Times. And she's currently actually doing an internship in the US uh, for the Straits Times. So you see, there's really a wide range of uh, uh, professional occupation you can uh, you can think of 
really the uh, uh, South, Southeast Asian Studies degrees give you, of course, the knowledge, but also a set of skills that make you a very versatile, adaptable uh, worker. Thanks, Patana. I think, uh, I think uh, your answer, right, well, it speaks to, I mean, I mean uh, the other departments as well, right, when we talk about job, exactly. job prospects, right, I think uh, employers generally, right, value, right, the kind of cultural sensitivity, right, our students have when they graduated from our, one of this, uh, the, our five uh, Asian uh, studies department, right, they, 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 they I mean, they, they often Right, told us that uh, it is not easy, right, to find someone, right, with that kind of cultural sensitivities, right, that uh, that they they actually uh, especially value, right. So I mean, we have a few questions uh, coming in, right. But uh, in the interest of time, may I suggest that we actually we defer this uh, to the second half, right, of of because there are some are quite specific about I mean uh, each department, right. So can we actually defer that to the second? I mean the second Q and A sessions out after. Right, we do our like five minutes presentations. Would that be good for the, I mean, uh, the panelists? Great. Okay. So, um, so I will now invite right the representative of each department to spend about um, five minutes right to uh, to uh, to expand on what Dr. Uh, Ethan has said just now right about why having a holistic understanding of Asia is important. Even you think that you are only interested in a certain part of Asia, for instance, Southeast uh, Southeast Asia or China. Right, and then uh, we'll go with the alphabet that uh, alphabetical order of the department, and uh, starting with me, right, Chinese studies, then followed by Japanese studies, Malay studies, uh, South Asian studies, and finally Southeast Asian studies. Okay, so now it's my turn, right? Okay, so uh, as the name of the mind department suggests, right, we study China and everything uh, Chinese. Uh, China is of course a very big country, right? But during my generation, right, when I was growing up, China was really not that important. But your generation, right? You guys have to deal with the fact that China is now already a superpower, and regardless of whether you like it or not, right? And I don't think, right? I need to persuade you, right? That in order to understand China today, right? You can't look at China in isolation, right? Take COVID or the ongoing U.S.-China uh, conflict, for example, right? What happened uh, in China or with China, right? Will have a spillover effect that affects everybody else, right? So my my department has made it a point, right, to study China in a global context. And Asia, right, it's a very big part of the story because this is how China positions itself today. But right? it, it sees itself as one of the leaders of Asia and portrays the West, right, like my America, eh, as the counterpart or even the opponents of Asia, right? Uh, uh, the opponents of Asia in general or China in particular, right? But remember, right, China is only one of the players, right? They are complementary or contested narratives coming out from India, Japan, Korea, right? Different parts of Southeast Asia and the Malay world, right? We cannot afford to neglect all these other narratives, right? Because China, right, must often adjust its strategies accordingly, right? To respond to these other claims, right? That's why we cannot afford to not pay attention to Asia, right? As a uh, geopolitical unit, even though it is mostly a social construct as pointed out by uh, Dr. Ethan, right? Even as our focus is on China, right? So I think this is why, right, even if some of you, right, are really interested, right, in uh, Chinese studies, right, we should not ch uh, study China in isolation. And NUS, right, provide a kind of a platform, right, a kind of perfect environment, right, for you, right, to understand China in an Asian and global context. Okay, so that's my, I mean, that's how I try to persuade you, right, <laughs> to do Chinese, uh, China Chinese studies with us and not with, you know, right, the other universities. <laughs> okay, okay. So I will now pass the mic right, to Dr. Ethan, right, who now speaks as a specialist on Japan. Right, over to you again, Clay. All right, thank you. And I've changed my background to my favorite city in the world, Osaka, where I spent a bit of time. So Japanese studies, um, Japan, as many of you are already familiar with, has a long-standing and major historical relationship. Singapore. In Southeast Asia. And that's actually one of the things that you can study in the Japanese studies department. We have a whole module on the relationship between Singapore and Japan. And it's not just about, though I give one lecture there, World War II, which is my specialty, but it covers that whole relationship. But the cultural and economic connections between Singapore and Japan mean that it is a very important place. And there's a large presence of Japanese businesses, Japanese residents, not just here in Singapore, but in the surrounding region too. Right, So a lot of connections to the contemporary world. 
But one thing that's really nice about the Japanese studies department and Asian studies in general is again, it's an interdisciplinary department. We have people who specialize in business. We have people who specialize in politics. We have people who specialize in popular culture, history. You can study everything from corporate culture to video games. And actually you can study the interaction between those two because they are quite connected as well, right? One thing that we try to do in the department is really meet you where your interests are. So if there's a particular thing that you're interested about in Japan, we'll find a way to help you pursue those interests. We're also very dedicated to helping people learn the language and get to experience uh, exchange in Japan, right? And while again, that has been uh, troubled by the pandemic, we're doing everything again to reestablish those connections. Um, and so that's something that we want to focus on right away. In addition, there's quite a bit of support for exchange to Japan, but sometimes it can take a while to get applications going. And so if you're interested in an exchange experience or interested in learning the language, I do strongly recommend that you look into it relatively early. Tons of opportunities, but some really benefit taking an early look, those sorts of things. And so as a department, right, there are many ways that Japan is connected to Southeast Asia and Singapore today and historically but we really do work to meet you where your interests are. And you get a great opportunity to meet tons of other students who have all sorts of different interests related to Japan, right? And learn from them as well. And I'll just note, because I saw a question about it, that we also, because of the many connections, especially say in popular culture or business, there are opportunities to pursue Korean studies in the Japanese studies department as well. So if you're interested in that, there are avenues to pursue in Japanese studies too. All right, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Jay. Yeah, there's a great, I mean, glaring gap, right, in our Asian studies of offering because we don't have Korean studies, right? Um, because of like legacy issues, right? But uh, that, that, that's, uh, that's beyond our control, right? But I think that, I mean, our focus on uh, Asia, right? As an integrated unit, right? Should be able, should be, um, should be able right? To cater to your interests as well. Right. And, and because of like the, I mean, those institutional things that you talk about, we do have people who specialize in Korean studies, who also work on Japanese studies. And so they offer courses on the subject as well. Yeah. Okay. So uh, next, I, I will invite uh, Dr. Sriani, right, from Malay Studies. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Chang Wei. Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm um, Dr. Sariani Suratman uh, from Malay Studies. I'm trained as, um, as um, a social anthropologist. Um, and my area of, uh, of, of interest is um, on gender relations yeah, in families and households. Um, uh, and and um, I, I look at um, uh, women, uh, connections of women, work, and 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 family. Okay, so um, as as um, what my other colleagues have already said, you know, um, Malay studies um, is 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 a, is a, a, a study um, that you know that looks at you know certain groups of people in a certain areas that have connections, yeah, to. Um, uh, different parts of the world. So in Malay studies, we are studying peoples who in their minds, yeah, think themselves as uh, Malays and part of what is they call Malay world or Alam Melayu in, in, um, in Malay. So um, to connect that to, to the kind of um, uh, research that I do. So I, my research is not only on Malays in Singapore, but also studying um, Malay families and households in Malaysia, Indonesia, as well as uh, Southern uh, Philippines. So the Malay world is actually very extensive, um, you know, that looks um, also uh, at uh, Southern Philippines as well as uh, Southern Thailand, but also looking at those areas where you have Malay diaspora. So if you think in terms of what connects, yeah, uh, you know, all these different uh, places, I think it would be um, its history, the, uh, the history of, uh, you know, of the Malay uh, world, all these different countries sharing here, yeah, um, um, uh, a history uh, that uh, is shared in terms of kingdoms, yeah, that use, uh, you know, to, uh, to reign, yeah, in the Malay, uh, Malay world and the common experience of a maritime society that is very much exposed to a lot of movements and travels of peoples as traders, as uh, missionaries, yeah, passing through this, uh, uh, you know, to the Malay world, bringing along with them new ways of thinking, 
uh, and new ways of doing things, including religion, including you know all kinds of uh, 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 cultural uh, uh, practices. So um, the colleagues in my my studies uh, come from different disciplines. I, you know, as I said, I'm an anthropologist. We have political scientists, somebody who's trained in law. We have um, historians, and we are actually in the process of hiring and and bringing in you know other people who are trained in um, in other in other fields. The kinds of um, areas that we research on as well as uh, uh, teach um, is vast. You know, um, I, as I said, you know, I looked at Malay families and, uh, and households and looking at also broadly uh, gender studies. I have colleagues that look at uh, law, um, in, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, um, as well as looking at um, the political, yeah, uh, or social historical political context, yeah, of these different uh, countries. There are those who are looking at um, the arts, yeah, uh, as well as uh, those who are uh, focusing, yeah, on uh, um, literary uh, literary uh, uh, works. So again, because of these different um, areas, yeah, that we research on and teach our. Um, um, graduates here yeah, from Malay studies are found in a lot of areas similar to what uh, um, what Associate Professor Vatana was talking about. Yeah, in those areas of public and private sectors, in all the different uh, fields that she has um, outlined. Thank you. Thank you, Rani. Uh, uh, in the interest of time, uh, may I uh, invite uh, Rajesh, right? Sure. Okay. Hi, everybody. So uh, Chang Wei started off by saying that China was not well known then and uh, is much better known now. Uh, well, South Asia is still perhaps one of the least known uh, areas uh, in Asian studies. Uh, but uh, really one of the areas that I am convinced we, in, 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 in time to come is going to be one of uh, uh, a, a very important area of study. Uh, let me just introduce you to South Asian studies. We study India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, Nepal, Maldives, and Afghanistan. So these eight countries. Now, you may not think of these as particularly important. You often perhaps associate them with disaster, war, uh, poverty, underdevelopment. All of those issues certainly uh, are contained within South Asia. I mean, after all, it accounts for about 27% of the world's population. And you are going to see those issues. But Really, uh, to look at this region only in terms of that is something that we take for granted, which is something that Clay pointed out at the start and, and which we really need to be careful about. And at South Asian Studies, therefore, we look at a vast diversity of issues that extend beyond uh, not just the study of poverty, but also of gender, of change, of economic development, of... Uh, a variety of areas that may be of tremendous interest to you. For example, uh, we have a popular module on cinema. And of course, you know, Bollywood cinema has a tremendous influence uh, globally. But in addition to that, uh, off late, another module that, that has grown in popularity is what's cooking. Uh, and here we look at food ways and food culture in South Asia. Uh, we have a very interestingly titled module called love, sex, and marriage in South Asia. Uh, well, we've, we've got it all now. We've got cinema, we've got food, and we've got sex in our titles as well. Uh, so this is perhaps uh, uh, some of uh, the courses available to you at South Asian Studies. Uh, it is a tremendously diverse region. Uh, each of these regions, as I mentioned, display poverty and problems, but as well, uh, tremendous growth uh, and this is uh, some of the things that we uncover in the course of the module. And with that, I'll, I'll leave it here and allow my time to Vatana. Thanks, uh, Rajesh. Uh, so you sure your module has cleared MOE? Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Vatana, over to you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Shanoe. Uh, okay, so um, uh, obviously I'm not going to list uh, all the 11 countries uh, of Southeast Asia, but um, uh, just to give you perhaps a figure to show you the, the importance of the region. Uh, if you take uh, Southeast Asia, all the countries in Southeast Asia as a single economic uh, unit, it would uh, represent uh, the fifth largest economy. So 
Uh, to go straight to, to the points I'd like to develop here briefly, uh, one key aspect that our students uh, in our department, but also in other Asian studies department, really appreciate is that we take an interdisciplinary approach to our teaching. And therefore, we provide them with a diversity of perspectives on issues that are important within Southeast Asia, but also globally. And here I'd like to give you an example of a module so that we're teaching in our departments. It's a course on migration, diaspora, and refugees in Southeast Asia. Um, perhaps uh, you may know it already, but in 2020, Southeast Asia was home to almost 300,000 refugees and asylum seekers. People have always been, always been on the move across and beyond Southeast Asia looking for a better life. Aspiration and desire for mobility have never been stronger, and yet moving across borders has never been more difficult. So in that module, we're taking, as I said before, a diversity of perspective. We're not looking at history, the history of migration and diaspora, but we're also looking at uh, regimes of control, immigration policies that facilitate, but also restrict the migration. And we're also looking very importantly at human experience, how migrants experience their life away from the country of origin. And this uh, interdisciplinary approach, um, as one of our former students uh, told us, really help uh, our students to think creatively uh, between various disciplines, instead of being confined to just a single way of thinking. And here I'm quoting the words of one of our students. A second point I would like to convey to you is that, again, as uh, my colleagues uh, have told you, the fact that we live in a region in Southeast Asia gives you a unique chance to learn outside the classroom in the field. We can have we can offer you what I call what I call alternative classrooms. Uh, we take our students to temples, to museums, to galleries, but also to less conventional places such as rice fields, cemeteries, beaches. For example, one of our modules uh, take our students to visit coastal island communities. Uh, they explore marine, env marine environment and experience life at sea and on islands. Throughout this module, thanks to this module, students uh, can reflect on the diverse but interrelated issues in historical and contemporary perspective, on such is issues as colonialism, piracy, but also interactions between people and natural environment. And as one of our uh, uh, former students uh, again shared her experience with us, she said that uh, by studying in our department, she gained intimate and personal experience of Southeast Asian peoples and cultures. Vietnamese community in Singapore, Malay Muslim culture in South Thailand, for example. And I believe that at the end of the studies, uh, our students become really uh, the region's cultural ambassador. Cultural ambassador, not only of Southeast Asia, but if they take, if they go to South Asian studies uh, departments, they will become cultural ambassadors of South Asia, of South Asia, of the Malay world, of the Japanese world. They, they learn a language, Thai, Vietnamese, Indonesian, or Japanese. They have been involved in field trips in Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, done field research on the ground, uh, and so on and so forth. And again, as I said to you earlier, when uh, I was uh, uh, explaining the wide range of careers you could go in after getting a degree in Asian studies or departments, uh, all this field experience will help you uh, in your profession. Uh, become to be versatile, adaptable, thanks to having acquired cross-cultural competencies. Um, and my last uh, um, point is that um, we will keep offering our students this immersive uh, experience of learning. Uh, also by engaging with people and communities. I would like here to stress the fact that our academic staff 
are not only scholars, but also practitioners. For example, one of my colleagues, who is a cultural geographer, has worked as an advisor on cultural heritage in Singapore. Another, who is an environmental anthropologist, has been involved for many years in community engagement activities in Singapore and in Malaysia. She even co-founded an NGO that is active in maritime uh, conservation in Malaysia. So you see, uh, academic and intellectual work does not need, do not need to be confined within the university's uh, world. And also, and very importantly, can have societal impact. So let me uh, conclude here with, um, uh, with two final points. Um, if you come to our Asian studies departments, um, you will learn about the regions, of course, in intellectual ways, but also through personal connections with the place and its peoples. Our departments are academically rigorous, but also offer a very friendly environment. And I will finish here. Thank you. Thank you, Fatada. So uh, I think we have about five uh, to eight minutes, and then um, and we do have uh, several questions, right? I mean, there are some questions that could be, I mean, easily answered. For instance, uh, is Malay studies conducted in Malay or English? Or do I need to know the Japanese language to be able to major in uh, Japanese studies? So, uh, Claire and Sharon. Um, Claire, you Okay, yeah, so let me just go. So um, the majority of the modules that are offered in the department are conducted in English, um, except for um, um, maybe two or three, um, um, yeah, three modules um, on Malay literary, uh, uh, Malay literature. Um, um, you have, uh, you know, a knowledge of, of the uh, uh, of Malay language is necessary uh, because we are also looking closely at text. You know, whether it is the classical Malay text or uh, Malay novels, but otherwise, all the all the other modules, yeah, are conducted in English. Okay. Um, and just a quick note about Japanese studies. And so, there is generally a language component to Japanese studies, but it varies depending on the track you're on, right? So whether you're a single major, a second major, a minor. It can vary based on what you're pursuing. So I would, uh, we don't really have time to go into all the details here, but you can find all this information about prerequisites on the Japanese studies website. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, and then there's also another question for Japanese studies. What's the intake for Japanese studies specifically? And will there be an interview? I don't think so. Yeah, does Beeling, is Beeling here? I thought we were having, we had some people who might help us answer the questions. Oh, my and sense is that so in general. In, in, into any of these departments, you enter into CHS and you can choose your major. You will have tremendous flexibility in allowing you to choose uh, the major. Uh, Changwei, can I just take the question yeah. on NTU Asian Studies as mm -hmm. the menus? I think one of, uh, without, of course, putting down NTU, uh, although most of their uh, people who teach in NTU humanities have been trained by Asian studies at uh, NUS, I should say. Uh, I should also mention that the great depth uh, that you have in Asian studies in NUS is unparalleled in any university in, in the Singapore context or even in the more broadly in the region. So this is something that you should be well aware of. And indeed, many of these specialists who now are in different universities across Singapore uh, were a former doctoral students of ours. Okay, so I just thought you should know that. Thank you. And uh, I think there's a question for Clay, right, on HSA 1000, right? What are the assessment structure like? <laughs> I think this is okay. a question that many, many students are concerned with. Is that, okay, so that's an HSA 1000 question. Okay, so uh, is part of making these connections between uh, what we're covering in class and the world around us and yourself outside the university, we, our first assignment is an individual assignment where you write a personal essay about your own history and your family's history, right? And where we ask you to connect some of the things that we cover in class to what you find in various interviews we encourage you to do, say with family members or people who have been important to your history, like a teacher or mentor, people like that. The topics that we cover in this semester going into that assignment are race and ethnicity and migration and diaspora, something that things that really shape 
a lot of what goes on in Singapore. And so seeing those connections is what we really encourage in the assignments. And then there's a group assignment that asks you to do a similar thing with a neighborhood in Singapore, or if you're not in Singapore, your local neighborhood, wherever you're based, where you go to that neighborhood and talk about the different sites in that neighborhood and how they connect to the content we're covering in class. And so for this semester, we'll have also covered social inequality and religion by, that by the time that assignment is due. And so making connections between sites on the ground and the content we cover in class is something we really encourage you to do. And as many of us discussed, field experience and exchange are an important part of Asian studies. And that's part of a way to have that sort of field experience, the beginning of it, before you might go further afield later in your university career. And there are also, at the, as, the te as the class is currently constructed, we have um, a uh, uh, last test in the last week of the class where you write short essays in response to some questions. There are also presentations that groups give in their tutorials um, about the various topics that we cover. And so there's group work involved, but a lot of it is about making those connections between the content we cover in class and life outside the classroom, including you as an individual and neighborhoods of Singapore or beyond. Thank you very much, Clay. And uh, I've been instructed right to end this session, right? But before yes. we end, right, I've also been instructed by Rajesh, right, to mention our Asian Studies minor again, right? So HSA one thousand, right, is really the kind of capstone module, right, for you to actually to to explore further, right, uh, in Asian studies. So even if you are not, I mean, not intending to do a major, right, in one of our uh, one of our departments, right, if, if even if you are over at science or or whatever, right. Asian studies minor, right, is really, right, I think is a very interesting options for you to consider, right? Okay, with that, uh, thank you very much, and thank I you. hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank, thank you so much, Prof. Ong thank you. And, thank uh, you. All our panelists, um, it, time is never enough when we are having a very fruitful discussion. Um, we are now just putting up a poll uh, on your screen. So if um, the students here can help us complete this poll, it will help us inform the April and May uh, sort of outreach events that we are planning. So uh, students who are here, uh, please do indulge us by responding to these questions. Uh, meanwhile, let me just uh, remind you that if um, there are any questions that we may have not been able to respond to here, uh, you're welcome to email us at askchs at nus.edu.sg. Um, let us know if there's anything we can help you with. Um, Meanwhile, do follow our social media channels uh, to pick up on what are our upcoming events and activities. Um, pencil in your calendar 11th to 14th May. We have a CHS open house planned. And in April, we have a series of department engagement activities as well. So um, while waiting for you to complete the polls, uh, just to let you know, the next session will begin at 3 p.m and it's a humanities uh, panel discussion. Um, you can access the webinar link from the CHS Open House website. Um, otherwise, one of my colleagues will paste it in here. And actually, real quick, because I yes. noticed from the chat that I might have understood an earlier question, just in case you were asking about whether Japanese studies modules are conducted in Japanese, no, they are conducted in English. So just in case you're asking that question, that's an answer. That's the answer. Okay, then. Thank you so much. Uh, we can end the poll. And professors, thank you again for sparing time from your busy schedule. We always love to hear from you and look forward to further engagements. Thank you so much. Um, we can perhaps uh, just do a quick shout out of the next session uh, once. Yeah. So the next